Good evening, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Mondal, for this invitation to this uh, training the next generation scientist in your lab. It is really a pleasure and honor being with you here. Uh, today, I would like to discuss with you about the Intelligent Microscope Project. This means uh, to try to find new landscapes with a project that we call Momics, and I will convince you, I'll try to convince you about its uh, relevance. Well, this is my group in general, just a picture made yesterday. We had a retreat of the group, and this is a group working around the multimodal project. Um, it's a very young group uh, with very good scientists, and thanks to them, and also thanks to Parta Pratim Mondal, Professor Mondal, um, in the past and today, we published some interesting books, maybe for you, like Fundamentals of Fluorescence Microscopy, and today, Expedition into the Nano World. Yes, the Nano World. The world we are interested in with our microscope. Uh, the biological world that moves from organs and tissues to cells, 10 microns, down to one micron for organelles and other aggregation of molecules, and then down to protein and DNA, down to the one nanometer. But now, the point is that uh, not only these kind of uh, objects are small, but in some way they are also transparent. I mean, in case uh, your molecules are able to absorb light from the sun, you would burn. So we can say that we could perform what is called perfect imaging when trying to image something passing light through biological objects. Unfortunately, when we play this kind of imaging and the object is transparent, there is no contrast that we can detect. Like this glass that is transparent. And in order to see something, to see some interesting regions, we have to decorate this. The way we decorate cells and macromolecules uh, in the last uh, tens of years uh, is called fluorescence. So we have specific molecules that can bind specific um, biological macromolecules offering them the possibility to be seen by emitting a color, so some energies, when you shine other energy, say, excitation light. Uh, a friend of mine, a pioneer in, in fluorescence microscopy, David Jameson, when we asked him why fluorescence, he replied, come on, because it's pretty. Well, it's fine, it's pretty, a lot of colors, but the main issue related with fluorescence is that when you have your fluorescent probe in the molecule uh, attached to the molecule and in the biological system this probe is able to sense uh, flow of ions temperature changes ph changes polarity viscosity electric fields and many other agents uh, around the fluorescent molecule itself yeah, it's pretty, it's brilliant. In fact, I don't know if you have the, the chance to visit in Rome the Cappella Sistina, but when you watch to the Michelangelo painting, I'm quite sure that your eyes go to the blue veil of the Virgin. The reason, one of the reasons, is that the pigment for this color for the painters, for Michelangelo, is not only reflecting the blue light, but is also shining its own light, since it's fluorescent. A real pioneer, and please let me tell you that uh, this is a book that you should read, Perspectives in fluorescence, on fluorescence was uh, Gregorio Weber. Gregorio Weber, like Galilei, 
many, many years before, brought to us three simple words, verbs, observe, interpret, and communicate what you see. Today, uh, we have really a lot of colors we can use using a microscope to communicate what we can see inside, inside mitotic cells, inside daisy pollen, using colors for bringing to the attention of the observer details that you could lose. These colors in the neurons are related to the mutual distribution and also to the mutual function, not only for aesthetics. And when you move to Martin Chalfie's studies on the worm, what you see is that the expression of a specific protein that is also able to um, emit light, a green fluorescent proteins, offer you the possibility of following the development of the nervous system. This also can be done in living system, as Betsy Nobel laureate for super resolution microscopy did years ago. But now the main point is that in order to take advantage of this possibility that you have, uh, you have in some way to build your instrument or to have a very good commercial instrument, why not? When you build your instruments, you have so many new technical advances, but what you really need are the basic concepts. The basic concepts are related to the fact that you, this is the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope, that you have a piece of glass, rounded piece of glass, inserted in a stable material, like in this case a metal, and you can have light passing through and you can see better details. Better details of what? Of the world of the world that you want to investigate. In our case, the biological cell. Here what you see is the intricate world of the biological cell uh, with all around the network made through the interaction. But now, when you go through the development of your microscope, you have a lot of questions arising uh, and let me tell you that you have, uh, you can consider today two different approaches. One is the probes approach and the other one is the optical approach. But if you watch to this picture, you immediately realize that uh, there is a lot of uh, on-demand issues that people is asking. Live cell imaging resolution, multidimensionality, versatility, super resolution microscopy. So many. And today we can manage all of them using light. But since before we were worried about the fact that our objects are transparent, we couldn't see them, except if we use, let's say, I understand, confocal micro, uh, phase contrast microscopy, or we add fluorescent molecules. We have another issue related to how much you can distinguish them when they are very close one to the other. This is a real seminal paper about resolution and super resolution by Colin Shepard. If you, I'm quite sure you recognize the Abbe formula, let you know, and it's very intriguing in this paper, that Abbe never wrote that formula, even if his uh, paper oversighted uh, is in agreement with the formula. But if Abbe was able to define quantitatively what does it mean resolution, about super resolution was an Italian physicist, Giuliano Toraldo di Francia, in 1955, to talk for the very first time about super resolution. Giuliano Toraldo di Francia was a physicist, so he never had in mind that you can violate physical laws. So diffraction limit is there and you cannot do anything about diffraction limit. So how can we get super resolution? Well, if you read this paper, you will find that uh, it's very simple. Simply add 
information about the image formation process and use this information plus the diffraction information limited coming from the lens to form your final image. Today, you can do this very well. You have uh, powerful computers to perform this kind of link between the information you know about the sample, about the way you're interrogating the sample, the diffraction limited system and the final image format on your digital screen. Well, Mats Gustafsson did this uh, in an excellent way. Uh, when he introduced structured illumination microscopy, he had clear in mind the kind of information he could add, where information superimposing on the details of the sample hidden by the fractional limit, some details that he knew very well using a grid, a resolution grid, and rotating this grid and taking advantage of the knowledge of this grid, it could reconstruct, as you see in the middle and on the right side, an image that shows you the cell and the components inside with a resolution that is unexpected. And in case you are playing with fluorescence in a nonlinear way, could be unlimited. Now, in order to take advantage of this idea of Toral de Francia, why not adding more point of view to the scenario we want to study? This is the reason why we decided to move to a new sensor that has many eyes. You shine light on one point, and instead of collecting information from one point, you have an array of points collecting light for you. A spot array, single photon counter, avalanche detector. Single photon counter. You shine light, and usually what you do with a single point detector is like collecting light only from the central element of that matrix you see on the upper right side. But in our case, we collect information from all the other 25 points. And you could say, come on, the information is shifted, is blurred, right? But we know the way it is shifted. It is, in case, distorted. And this is the reason why, taking advantage of all this information, image scanning microscopy, first introduced by Colin Shepard, and then uh, demonstrated in the very brilliant way by Jörg Enderlein is what we consider the way for performing image imaging of the future. Image scanning. Instead of using a single point, you have a camera or you have an array. And then you take advantage of all the information spread in the different elements of the array to reconstruct your image. When you play this game, you can play this game under uh, linear excitation of fluorescence or to photon excitation of fluorescence doesn't matter. I think this is a very interesting paper about this topic, image formation, image scanning microscopy, including the case of to photon excitation. But this kind of array, single photon counter, has another key property. The elements are very sensitive to the arrival of photons in time. So you can detect the time needed for what we call lifetime emission of our fluorescent molecules. And these, this fact, can tell you a lot of things in terms of spectroscopy of the fluorescent molecule. Hopefully you remind one of my very first slides about the fact that not only pretty are the fluorescent molecules, but they are able to change their emission, including the lifetime, as function of what's going on around. So really you can perform spectroscopy, forming an image with this kind of information, forming an image in a super resolved way. This is what we decided to bring in our developed uh, microscope 
Uh, this is a startup here in Genoa and it's called Genoa Instruments. Now, from this point, we can now move to see what we would like to insert in this microscope that we built by ourselves. And today is already a commercial product called Prism. Well, let's switch again to super resolution. You know about an overpriced 2014. And the motivation is a, a great motivation for a realistic quantitative description at the nanoscale resolution of the dynamics of what's going on in biological processes. Come on, this is what we would like to do. And I have to say that one of the winner, the three were Eric Betzig, W. Murner, and Stefan Hell. Stefan Hell, years before, was reporting in a um, paper in a review a statement that is great, in perfect agreement with the idea of Giuliano Toraldo di Francia. The fractional barrier is crumbling. In Italian, crumbling sounds like sgretolata. There is some poetry, I don't know in Indian, uh, which is the translation, but think that you don't mind about the fractional limit. Doesn't matter, the fractional limit. And a very simple idea. It's not a matter of winning against the fraction, you cannot. How can you circumvent it? Well, in a very simple way, by precluding the simultaneous emission of adjacent spectrally identical fluorophores. When you play this game, you have two chances in this Nobel Prize uh, uh, idea. One is that if you are sure that the emitter is a single molecule, you can improve your localization of a factor that is like the square root of the number of photons you are able to collect. So you can imagine that the, using a bright fluorescent molecule, you are able to collect 10,000 photons. You can improve your localization precision from 200 nanometer down to 2 nanometer. The other issue is the one related to the interrogation idea uh, provided by Stefan Hell. Well, simply using a second beam of a certain strength, or you could say power of the beam, for shrinking the information you are reporting to your detector. When you play this game of shrinking or a wide or single molecule, or including structural illumination, provided by Mats Gustafsson, that was not part of the Nobel Prize simply because, unfortunately, he passed away before and very young. In case we write IIT, Italian Institute of Technology, with a wide field microscope, oh well, maybe we can, with some processing we can, uh, we can go to the IIT. But if you play the three other methods of super resolution in the idea of Giuliano Toraldo di Francia of adding information, this once about the floor for, you can clearly read IIT. But this is not what I wanted to do. Come on, is what I want to do, but there is more than this. More than this is that I can start thinking that I can count molecules one by one using an optical microscope. Yes, single molecules. Single molecules placed in different places in my sample. And this was the very brilliant idea of W. Murner and uh, Michel Ory was able to demonstrate this uh, in the fluorescence domain. But I have to say that the key for Murner and Betzig to get super resolution investigating single molecules comes from the great idea and realization by George Patterson that was PhD student in the Jennifer Lipkoschwarz lab. Unfortunately, George passed away last year, very young. Photoactivatable fluorescent molecules. So they are silent 
and you decide when they want they shine or not. This was the idea performed by Betzig uh, at home, you see the microscope at home, uh, in a very simple way. Uh, on the bottom line, what you see are single molecules on the left side. Single molecules of one acquisition, and then uh, you switch them on, you wash them counting photon, and if you superimpose one to the other, what you get is the information in the center, an old image. But if you calculate the center the, with the precision of localization improved by a factor square root of n, and you make this map, so you add this information, you have uh, uh, a better resolved image on the right side. Uh, maybe you can see it better here from the left to the right, including the Z. But maybe, well, I'm quite sure, you notice that this is imaging of uh, thin objects, single cells, filaments. What about uh, thick objects? When you have thick objects like these that are, is a tumoral spheroid, the problem you have is that you have uh, a lot of fluorescence that is forming a background that is very difficult to understand if the photons come from the single molecule you are watching or from other regions, above and below, for example, the focal plane. You have a plenty of fluorescence. And so you could be, I mean, you can improve the factor square root of n, where n is the number of photons collected, but this is true only if you are sure the photons come from that single molecule. So with Francesca Celazanaki that will have another lecture in this uh, important school, uh, we decided to play with selective plate illumination in order to cut uh, background from adjacent regions and within the selected plane of illumination performing single molecule. And if you play this game, you can navigate in thick samples like this one. And when you navigate, you see uh, 10 micron by 10 micron. Now we are with a sample of 100 micron. You can detect frame by frame single molecules. And so you can build a final image that has a better content of information in terms of resolution. And in order to have your plane of illumination homogeneous, what you can do is to use a multi-photon excitation beam, photo activation beam. Since the multi-photon moves from the blue to the red, you have less distortion due to scattering when you penetrate in the object. And so you have the blade of your selected plane of illumination constant through the sample. But now, if you leave the single molecule, uh, you can go to the Stefan Held method, the STED, stimulated emission depletion. What does it mean? It means that I bring the molecule to the excited state. When they're close to come back to the ground state emitting fluorescence, I push them to deactivate in a region where I don't watch the signal, the red region, I watch in the green. And I play this game in a very targeted way. So with a kind of pinhole made by a second beam properly shaped. So at the very beginning, the brush of you, pointless painter, is uh, the one you see here. And if you play this game, your brush becomes sharper. But what I like of this method is the fact that 
With the best confocal microscope of this image, you switch on the second beam and without any calculation, in case of single molecule, you need uh, hundred thousands of calculations per point. Immediately, you see better. Uh, do you remember the Abbe formula, even if Abbe never wrote it? Well, you can modify it a little bit. What you see here is 1 plus the ratio between J and J sat. What does it mean? It means that J is the power of the beam that wants to push the molecule to the excite in a region where I don't watch the red region. And I sat is a property of the fluorescent molecule. And the meaning is I sat is the intensity you need for depopulating with the second beam the excited state 50%. So you can immediately understand that when this ratio is very high, D tends to zero. And when you switch off the second beam, so I is a zero, you are in the Abbe formula. With the Abbe formula, you can get this. Shining a second beam, you can get this. And the improvement is given by the power you put there, the strength of this operation, it means the probability of being able to have some molecules deactivating in the red instead of in the green. Just to give you an idea, when this ratio is 90, you can reach 16 nanometer resolution. Uh, when you improve this number, you can get 7.6 and you can have a precision of localization down to one angstrom if you want to count also photons from each point emitting. But now, uh, I have to tell you, I'm not sure if you know already about this, that at the end of April, in bioarchives there was this paper by Stefanel uh, and his lab where they demonstrated that using a variation on the theme of STED and using the donut beam and using a, a trick related to photo activation and following what's going on with single molecules, they are able to get a resolution of one nanometer and a precision of localization down to one angstrom. What about the cell? Well, oh, come on, you can play this game. The blue beam, that is a conventional brush, plus the power of a second beam uh, into the cell. Yes, this is what you can do. And you can select not only by scanning, but also scanning with the second beam the regions you are interested in for getting a super resolved image. You can apply this to the filaments, but you can also apply this to the nuclear pores. This is the best image you can get with a conventional microscope. But with a STED, you can get the, the real organization of protein around the nuclear pore. Now, unfortunately, increasing the power for getting a better resolution has some disadvantage. One of them, since I'm from Genoa, is the cost of the laser. And uh, if you have to put a huge number of photons, you need high cost lasers and you cannot parallelize in case you want to speed up. The other, from the biological sample point of view, is that uh, you could induce some photo damage or some fluorescence because it's true that in the red, your molecules do not uh, absorb and emit too much, but it's not true that they don't do this at all. And so a very small number in terms of absorption cross-section um, can count something if the huge amount of light is used. So again, with the game played before with our donut beam, what are we doing? We are perturbing fluorescence around. 
And so even if uh, some of the black spots passes through the donut because the power is not too much, the time of arrival to our sensor, so lifetime, in one case is green, is the appropriate lifetime of the molecule. In the other case is faster because there is another possibility for going to the ground state. Practically speaking, this means that you have two knobs. One is the power of the stat beam and the other one is tuning in terms of temporal arrival of photon. Now, instead of removing those photon, you could also classify them and put them in uh, different cells according to their lifetime. This means that you are able to define through lifetime the position of the emitter. And if you play this game like Luca Lanzano did, you have the confocal, then gated is the stead using time. But if you classify them and you record them according to the lifetime, you have the split. Since background in is in some way temporally uncorrelated, you can remove it without producing artifacts. Of course, you can play this game also under two photon excitation. When fluorescence is primed, when fluorescence is uh, realized, you can start playing any other game, single molecule or stead. And since now we have a very high resolution, what is relevant is that we can really perform correlative nanoscopy. So using at a comparable way, a comparable level of resolution, atomic force microscopy instead, before using only confocal, we could learn something, but not too much. But today coupling uh, stead and atomic force microscopy, we have a, the unique chance to provide with the specificity the not specific image coming from force interactions. Now, in case you're interested to read uh, the latest result in this uh, topic, I can suggest this paper that is uh, open access paper on the website. But now, going to the end of my talk, let's talk about the future of microscopy. Well, from my point of view, the future of microscopy is uh, liquid tunable microscopy. So tuning of the possibilities we have in terms of wavelengths and in terms of interaction with the sample. Label free, we will see in a while. And fluorescence dynamics. Why fluorescence dynamics? Because as for my first slide, about how pretty is fluorescence, the chance we have to record changes in fluorescent emission related to what's going on around the molecules we're interested in is a unique chance we have with this kind of microscope. Label free. Let's think in a while why label free. So, we have seen fluorescence, some super resolved methods uh, from the Nobel Prize to other methods. And we want to add other methods that are the label free in this momics approach. And now I bring to you this rather complicated architecture. It's a complicated architecture because it contains everything you have seen before in terms of imaging now in terms of components. So in the central part is the sample. You can perform selective plane of illumination. You can perform lifetime. You can perform to photon excitation, stead, single molecule. You can use a super continuum white light lasers. You have so many instruments at your disposal that you can start thinking to put all together in order to be able to 
tune your microscope when you have a specific question? Well, this is Bomex. A lot of data. Using uh, so many, let's say, modalities of interaction with the sample. But now we need uh, another element. So we have the lens, we have a visible light, and now we can add uh, intelligence. We can use all the advantages done in terms of artificial intelligence from the 50s, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Now we know how to train our algorithm using data. Well, many years ago, we started with this concept. Uh, it's very simple. I mean, we call this maybe pattern analysis. We wanted to define some patterns in the sample in order to recognize different samples by a simplified decomposition of the elements inside. For example, in my case, many years ago, we used uh, associative memories, a nice way for getting uh, patterns. But today, I think that we can use new algorithms in artificial intelligence. The one we like is called uh, independent component analysis. And the final goal is to be able to provide a set of uh, images with a reduced complexity in order to take decisions. So we have our images coming from all the modalities. We start assigning weights. We start extracting uh, um, details and we reduce the complexity when we recognize uh, something in the life of the cell with respect to other things uh, that allows you to use in a very to transform our microscope in an intelligent microscope so the idea is that we want to have a lot of information coming from literature from correlative methods from optical methods all them inside our system at the very first step for training, so in the machine learning, supervised machine learning, and then pass through the layers of the deep learning in order to get an output that can be pathological or healthy output. Artificial intelligence, as you know probably better than me, requires data. Uh, this training has to be done and uh, we decided to start from a sample that is a rather complicated sample inside each cell there is a nucleus inside this nucleus there is at a very high level of compaction chromatin dna kind of way for having uh, a sliding door that can open the door for releasing information from the dna when is needed uh, this is called chromatin, chromatin dynamics, architectural elements. Uh, it's amazing what you can find inside. And what is more amazing is that uh, every five years, there is a different model that tends to describe what's going on. And what is nice for a microscopist is that really now you have uh, different scales you can navigate across using the optical microscope from hundreds of resolution down to one nanometer. There was a very interesting paper in the summer of 2017, so four year, uh, five years ago, reporting about a new model of chromatin, a new model of uh, organizing of these uh, uh, arrangement made by proteins and DNA. The way is compacted is the key for understanding something. Well, of course, we can use fluorescence. Maybe you heard about FRET. I don't mind to go into details about FRET, but with FRET, fluorescence, resonance, energy transfer, what you can do is the following. You have uh, two fluorophores linked with your sample 
when these four force are a distance is larger than 10 nanometer they shine their own light but when they go close one to the other below 10 nanometer one of the two instead of emitting light, transfer the energy to the other one that shines light due to this transfer. So you can easily understand at which molecular distances uh, some molecules are. And in the case of this overcrowded environment in the nucleus, uh, this is a very interesting information. So momics can be used for understanding chromatin. So let me call this chromix in case. But now, before ending, is the time of bringing to your attention label free, why? Because when the environment is crowded, I am quite sure that uh, you have in mind that if you add molecules, you increase the crowding. And when you increase the crowding, the organization of the molecules in a crowding environment that becomes overcrowded is different. Now, at the very beginning, it's useful to keep the fluorescent molecules because they have the specificity and to learn if you can follow changes in a crowded environment. In the future, we would like to remove the fluorescent molecule. We need, again, artificial intelligence in order to have a training in the understanding of what's going on and managing this large amount of data. The method I bring to your attention is called circular intensity differential scattering. It's nice. You have uh, uh, your sample you shine light and instead of detecting only the intensity or in our case also lifetime and other issues, you work on what is called polarization. Well, at the coffee machine, polarization uh, is a nice issue. Uh, when you go to the coffee machine and you insert your coin, you insert your coin in a polarized weight, right? If you insert 90 degrees, you don't get any coffee. If you throw your coin rotating in space through the machine, you have a chance to get your coffee. Well, you can play a similar game using polarized light. And uh, if you are able to control polarization of light, you are also able to control the effect that this kind of polarization has the effect that the sample has on this of this control polarization. Uh, there is a very simple, comparatively simple way introduced by Professor Muller in the 40s. Imagine that you are able to describe in a vector of four position, so on polarized, linear, 45 and circular, the shining light, the light you shine. Then you have your sample. And then when you collect light on your detector, there are some changes in the amount of light that was before 45 degrees or linear or circular right or left. Responsibility for this could be of the optical elements, but you can control this because you know very well uh, how each optical element works in terms of polarization or by the sample. The best way for linking a four input vector with a four output vector is using a very simple 16 element matrix. And so when you shine light, different elements tell you about the different properties of the sample. Let's assume that polarization, that let's assume that dichroism or birefringence are interesting for you. About dichroism is interesting to understand this point. In biology, molecular biology, there was a method introduced by Ignacio Tinoco um, that is called uh, circular dichroism, uh, also linear dichroism. Um, what does it mean? It means that uh, if you shine light in the absorption window of your molecule, in the ultraviolet in this case, and you control polarization, you can have an output 
that is function of the mutual arrangement of the molecules. Many years ago, uh, in the 80s, the very same group, and Carlos Bustamante uh, had his thesis on this topic, realized that there was a signal of circular dichroism outside the absorption bands. How this can be possible? Come on, no way. They studied the phenomenon and they discovered that this was due to some scattered light. And this scattered light was used for understanding something that is the organization of DNA. So you control polarization of light, you insert your sample, and you detected the changes to this. In case of circular intensity um, polarized light, I mean when circular is right or left, in case you meet superhelical structures or helical structures, you can find an information related to the way these helical structures are compacted. Now, simply let you know I'm sure you know already know about this. DNA has the propensity to have a, an helical structure. This is the organization that can be a superhelical and a superhelical. And this inside of the cell can be monitored by fluorescence using some fluorescent molecules that according to the intensity tell you something about compaction. Here, you see a demonstration, but we have to be more careful on the kind of signal we're going to record in this case, that in the blue image reports seeds that is sensitive to radius and pitch, so compaction less or more, and fluorescence where the green intensity is proportional to the level of compaction. We are learning, but this is what we want to do for including in momics the label-free approach. And since one of the aspects of interest is the circular polarization of light, we are also developing at home a Zeeman effect laser that is able to produce circularly right and left polarized light when you have some optical elements after the beam and you use the Zeeman effect with some magnets around an helium neon uh, laser. And this just to bring to you the latest results in our lab in terms of other elements that we are adding to the complicated architecture we have seen. Here is uh, the Zeeman effect laser uh, architecture. So Momics is going to add to all we are able to do in terms of fluorescence something that we are able to do in terms of label free in order to try to have as output something that we couldn't see before using the different modalities the light interacts with matter biological matter when matter changes this is the big difference between nanoscale resolution in optical microscopy and electronic mi electron microscopy. In the second case, you cannot follow events in time as we are able to do. And today we are able to do in a range that is from hundreds of micron down to few nanometer. So this work is done at the Astrolab in Genoa we have uh, some connection with European projects and other projects. Uh, this again was a picture of the group in another retreat uh, close to Genoa in Sesta Levante. And uh, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Parta from Parta Pratim Mondal, Professor Mondal for his invitation to this school. I'm sorry that I cannot be with you, but I hope to be able soon to come to Bangalore to discuss with all of you and to meet again Professor Monda that was one of the excellent researchers I had in my group 
in the past. So thank you for your attention. And in case you want to apply, we have postdoc and PhD position in our lab. Thank you very much indeed.